Yeah, welcome to the 27th Chaos Communication Congress in Berlin. So we are happy that you all made it here through wind and snow and pre-sale system. And uh, we and hope you should enjoy your time. And uh, to all the people who couldn't make it here, we hope that you enjoy the stream. And uh, we're starting with the keynote by Rob Congrat. Um. Good morning. Um, right here, exactly five years ago, Frank Riga and myself held a lecture that was called We Lost the War. Uh, it was about how we felt the fight over privacy and wider civil rights was going. Uh, for those of you who weren't there, it wasn't a very happy story. Um, it was at the height of the post 9-11 paranoia. It was a done deal that the whole EU was going to have data retention. And Frank and I set out to explore the future a little bit. I guess the pessimism in our talk was partly inspired by the awe, the sheer awe that we felt over this perfect storm. What we saw felt like, at that point, a desperate last stand in a world which was facing economic non-sustainability, climate change, major power shifts, and the end of cheap oil and many other natural resources. Um, all of this was happening in the next few decades, each independently. These are factors capable of causing serious mayhem. Now, a lot of what we predicted for the short term did in fact play out. It there are many more people today than in 2005 that the world is headed for turbulent times and that this perfect storm that we saw is still very much out there. But obviously the fight over privacy is still ongoing, so in that sense we were wrong. We did not in fact lose the war, at least not completely and not everywhere. In Germany, this became apparent when the Constitutional Court started defending privacy and civil liberties in earnest. Many of you already know this. They first told the government that cops cannot go randomly OCRing license plates of, of, oops, of traffic whizzing by on the, on the road just because they feel like it. Then they ruled that spying on people's computers is like spying in people's bedrooms and that it needed the same sort of stringent, uh, stringent laws to make sure that that didn't happen all over the place. And then, to cap it off, they killed data retention in Germany, at least for now. The court saved the day in such a grand way, and, and I think nobody in 2005 thought that was a very likely outcome, including the people that brought these cases to court. Imagine how easily these judges, like so many other judges, could have gotten all these complex issues wrong. Um, if you compare Germany to a bus, then it's like these judges jumping out of their seats pushing aside the driver and pulling the handbrake just before the bus tumbled into the ravine. And for them and for all of us, I hope these judges on the court live long enough for the rest of Germany to also see it that way. Uh, at this point, the bus driver is just trying to get these judges to release the damn brakes so the bus can keep moving. In March 2008, after the government installed spyware decision, but before it killed data retention, I wrote a long blog post admitting that I had given up too early and that at least in Germany, the fight over privacy was still ongoing. But I li don't live in Germany, I live next door in the Netherlands, and the perspective there is a little different. For one, we have a constitution, but no constitutional court. I've said this before, but under the Dutch system, it's simply assumed that parliament would never pass a law that would be unconstitutional. So the constitution is sort of a, a voluntary guideline for lawmakers. Um, and just in case the Constitution would get in the way of, of, of making laws, every prohibition in the Constitution ends with, unless warranted by law. Um, now, I don't only want to be negative. Uh, our Constitution does protect us, for instance, from munici municipal governments who can't make laws. So if they go rogue, we're protected by the Constitution. Um, what this means in practice is that the ne in the Netherlands, you need a parliamentary majority to stop anything bad from happening. So in the Netherlands, fear-mongering is a very effective way to pass oppressive laws and gain more power. And it has been used as such. Against the backdrop of increasing xenophobia, the Dutch are databasing everything that involves moving people, money, or bits to be used against us in various ways. We are now at the point where, without any specific suspicion, 
a Dutch homeowner can get a letter announcing a search of their home on a specific date and time in order to, quote, make the city safer. And whatever bits of surveillance states are missing in the Netherlands are being built at breakneck speeds. I think we can safely say that when it comes to civil liberties, my country is downwardly mobile. Lots of reasons, but I get on, to, on the top of my, I guess on the top of my list is a 20-year crisis in education. Uh, that would be a talk in itself. Um, the Netherlands used to be a country like Denmark or Sweden, then it was a country like Germany for a while in the 90s, and after a really confusing period in the, in the zeros with political murders and, and crazy political movements, it's now approaching England, and it's still going down. I'm, I'm sort of still guessing that we're... <laughs> My guess is still that we'll level out somewhere before we reach the level of Italy, but it's really, it really is becoming hard to tell. Now, I could talk more on some of the interesting things that are happening in the Netherlands, but that would also take a whole hour. Uh, what is important is that some of these things have served as examples of how things can go wrong, and that these examples were used, for instance, in the cases before the German Constitutional Court. So after 25 years, my country, the Netherlands, again has a leading role in discussions on privacy and civil rights. We are now the negative example that helps keep other countries avoid some of the worst transgressions. The last thing I will say about the increasing differences between the Netherlands and Germany is that Germany is not immune to any of the things that happen in Holland. Please remember that the market is not the answer for everything. Make sure that you keep your educational system functional. Watch where funding for political parties comes from, very important. Keep resisting fear as a basis for politics, and quite literally, by all means, defend your constitution and your constitutional court. Now, going back to this we lost the war speech five years ago, we actually ended up motivating a lot of people by pointing out the seriousness of the situation that we were in. Also, people see that technology is there and that they see all these nasty possibilities of technology and then they have this vision in their head that when the situation gets really bad, the hackers will come out and they'll magically save the day. And I think it's been healthy for people to hear that hackers themselves felt that this was a really bad situation that they didn't have easy answers for. Um, we probably also demoralized a few people Maybe, in retrospect, we shouldn't have been quite that negative. But in the 17 years before we lost the war, I personally brought a lot of my positive joy, my amazement to Congress. Uh, phone freaking, pager receivers, access for all, the fight against Scientology. Um, and after this speech, I did so with the, the whole voting machine episode, which also was a very positive story that ended well. So I think it's, it's okay for people here to see some of my negative and, and more depressing sides as well sometimes. Um, a little excursion into psychology and, and my own psychology and that of our species. Um, I'm probably, as many of you here, blessed with a mild form of bipolarism. That means I have lots of ups and downs. Uh, I don't get clinically depressed. I don't stay in bed for weeks. I never contemplate suicide, but I do have ups and downs. And around 2005, this came together with my probably midlife crisis, and I was grumpy and I was pissed off. Um, there were some personal factors, but the situation in the Netherlands and in the world was really a big part of the problem. Uh, this did get to a point where more and more people around me were telling me to go see a doctor. They told me, look, there's these pills now. You can be happy. You don't need to be like this. <laughs> and you'd be surprised how many people told me this, that really being unhappy for a prolonged period of time has become socially unacceptable over the past 20 years. Now, the role of depression, and, and again, I was never really clinically depressed, but the role of depression in the individual is understood to be the force that forces change, where change is short-term, painful, or costly, but much needed in the long term. And reading up on the truly insane numbers of people on antidepressants and other psychoactive pharmaceuticals, I can't help but wonder whether this unhappiness forces change principle stops at the individual. Could it be that we're prescribing antidepressants to so many people out there that we're now below the threshold on relatively smart, relatively resourceful, but unhappy people 
that are needed for society to make change. My sense is that this is a huge story, the story of a civilization destroying its capability to fix itself by making everybody artificially happy. I know this is not our field per se, but I feel this is at least, this is at least as big a story as many of the issues that this community is working on. I think in the future we'll see a scientific field called pharma pharmacological political science or something like that. And I have a feeling that people of the future cannot really understand our time without that field. One of the positive suggestions we did offer in We Lost the War was to focus on battles that could be won. If I had listened to all of these people around me, I would have been taking Prozac or Zoloft in 2005. My life would have been different and possibly much happier, especially in the short term, but a lot of things that happened to me since would not have happened because they involved me being angry and attempting to do something about it. Um, I'll quickly go into this electronic voting thing. Thank you. My own city, Amsterdam, opted to buy electronic voting machines for the elections of 2006. And I knew there was no possibility to verify the election outcome and that one had to essentially trust proprietary and secret software to have any trust at all. I spent the next two and a half years investigating, campaigning, lobbying, lawyering. Uh, around the same time, Ulrich Wiesner and his father Joachim were fighting voting machines, the same voting machines made by the same company here in Germany. I won't get into all of the details because that story has been told at previous congresses, but the short version is that the ensuing fight involved large parts of this community and that today these machines are not legal for use in elections in either country. Now, in Germany, that outcome is cemented securely in place by a constitutional court ruling that gives citizens the right to see with their own eyes whether election results come from something real or whether they come out of software somehow. Um, in the Netherlands, we'll have to fight this battle over and over again, all the time debating complex issues with small town mayors and municipal employees because we have no constitution. Um, I won't go into any de every detail of what happened to me since 2005, but I did have a really crazy past year. Maybe not quite as crazy as some of my friends, but still. For one, I probably traveled more in the last year than I, or year and a half than I did in the 10 years before that. It started in October 2009 when Julian Assange and myself were keynote speakers at Hack in the Box in Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur. We subsequently spent a month in the sun traveling Malaysia, Thailand, and Cambodia. We got to know each other pretty well. A month or two after the previous Congress, Geeks was still a relatively obscure, geeky, but gutsy journalism project. Julian and Daniel got a standing ovation while they stood on this stage speaking about WikiLeaks and about new opportunities for protecting freedom of the press in Iceland. Three weeks later, I was in Reykjavik with them and others to help write a proposal for IMI, the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative. Then I was home for a week and then I left for India to speak on voting machines. All of India has been voting on black box style voting machines for the past decade, so that's a billion people. And it's beginning to dawn on some of these people that there's a problem with transparency. I was there with Alex Haldeman, an e-voting related professor from the University of Michigan, and Till Jaeger, the German lawyer who won the case against voting machines here in Germany before the Constitutional Court. Together we met with politicians and we spoke at conferences, but probably the most important thing that happened was for Alex and myself to study an actual Indian voting machine together with our Indian colleague, Hari Prasad. Then I was home for three weeks again and I left for Iceland, this time to help out on releasing a video that's now famous, the Iraqi helicopter video that was released by WikiLeaks. I didn't plan for that. I read the WikiLeaks Twitter feed, concluded that Julian needed some help, and I flew out a few hours later. I stayed for two very hectic weeks, helping produce the video, and then traveled with Julian to a press conference in Washington. After that, I had to get back to writing the study on the Indian voting machines, which, hardly surprising, were just as easy to manipulate as any other black box voting system ever studied. We proved, yet again, that anyone with access to the machines could easily change the outcome of the election. Then later in the year, I went to Brazil to look at e-voting there. Now, their systems are even more dangerous than anyone else's. It's black box voting machines, but they get the ID card numbers of the voters entered into them. And <laughs> newer versions 
even have fingerprint scanners. <laughs> but, but of course, the software would never lie about the results of elections or store the vote and the voter in the same database. And since it prints out hashes of all the program files on the sort of MS-DOS-like box, it could never be manipulated. Brazil has perfectly secure electronic voting machines until we get our hands on them. <laughs> After Brazil, I was home for a week again and then traveled to India for two weeks. This time, we were there to help solve the problem instead of merely pointing it out. Alex Haldeman and myself were invited to a conference on voting, but as we arrived, we were detained for a night and half a day at the airport because we had apparently, quote, violated the terms of our visa the last time we had traveled to India. India's main intelligence agency had somehow investigated us as part of an international conspiracy to destabilize the state of India. We were eventually released after lots of phone calls and lots of ministries were involved. The home minister was woken up. Uh, uh, all sorts of things happened. And, from, and we had to promise that we would not attend this conference, which was a relatively sort of obscure academic conference. Um, from a PR stone standpoint, that whole thing didn't really work um, because we were now regular tourists, except CNN was waiting for us at the exit of the airport. But meanwhile, India still has a very serious problem that needs fixing urgently. Uh, India is the type of country that could easily slip into serious violence if there's too much doubt in election outcomes. So this is definitely a story that's to be continued. And there's a funny side note. Just two weeks ago, India and Brazil signed an agreement, a sort of a very bland uh, agreement that has very few details, but they uh, uh, involve working together on unspecified matters involving election organization. Um, WikiLeaks is a bigger issue that deserves a little bit more talking about. I helped WikiLeaks release the video. After that, I needed to get back to my e-voting related work, but I could have stuck around helping WikiLeaks do all these other things that they ended up doing. Uh, they could probably have used me uh, releasing all these other things. Um, that did not happen. And I guess I could make up all sorts of stories about how I disagreed with people or with decisions. But the truth is that in the period that I helped out, the possible ramifications of WikiLeaks managed to scare the bejesus out of me. Uh, courage is contagious, they say. Well, my ass. Um, I wish Julian and his people well, but I can't live a life out of a backpack on the run, not to mention that Julian has better and does much better on bites. <laughs> so what are we to make of WikiLeaks? It's clear that recent events will impact the world and our corner of it for some time to come. But it's really early to tell how, as things are still going on. WikiLeaks could well come out victorious in a new generational conflict, mentioned in the same line with the suffragettes and the Vietnam protesters. But as it stands today, my friend Julian is potentially facing prison time or even assassination for what essentially amounts to practicing journalism. At the same time, many people friendly to the ideas behind WikiLeaks are beginning to wonder what has been unleashed. Some of my friends have said, Julian has angered the gods. Bruce Sterling recently accused him of weeing all over the third rail. And a good friend of mine said that Julian was committing suicide by cop, even. Whatever, whatever we make of it, Present anger and fear at governments over, uh, over WikiLeaks will probably up the pressure to curb internet freedoms. Whether connected to WikiLeaks or not, Crypto Wars 2.0 has recently been announced. There's a new American proposal to make all providers of any kind of online service provide the authorities with clear text of everything that happens. As a result of WikiLeaks, authorities the world over will probably at least try even harder to clamp down on internet freedom. So organizations resisting this will have to work harder also. But we, regarding WikiLeaks, we also need to calm down a bit. There's obviously some very th big things going on here, and we need to keep watching them intently. But just because we like or share some of the principles at stake here doesn't mean our community is all of a sudden drawn into this all-out war with a ridiculously well-armed superpower or anybody else. 
Whatever our role is, it's certainly not to deny freedom of speech to people or organizations who don't like freedom of speech. This whole anonymous thing is so getting on my nerves. Uh, people ask me, anonymous, that's like the hacker community striking back, right? Um, and then I have to explain that unlike anonymous, people in this community would probably not issue press releases with our real names in the PDF metadata. Um, <laughs> And that if this community were to get involved, the targets would probably be offline a little more often. Uh, this is a mental maturity issue. Our community has generally succeeded in giving black belts in computer security karate only to people that have proven a certain level of mental maturity. Yes, some of us could probably do some real damage to PayPal or to MasterCard, but then we also understand that no good comes from that. In the unlikely event, by the way, that anybody here has not reached this level of maturity, uh, please do not connect your machine to the network. Talk to a lot of other people. Get some additional perspectives, because it's the way to go. Um, on the positive side, some of the care about that are dear to our hearts are going to get a lot of attention. And this attention can be used for good if we keep our, keep our wits about us. And finally, on the WikiLeaks issue, I now have cell phone coverage in my office in the basement, which I didn't have before. Yay. Now let's, let's take a wider look at today. As we enter uncharted terrain, we are the first generation in a long time to see our leaders in a state of more or less complete helplessness. Most of today's politicians realize that nobody in their ministry or any of their expensive consultants can tell them what the fuck's going on anymore. <laughs> they have a steering wheel in their hands, but they don't really know what it's connected to, if anything. Meanwhile, the brakes are obviously out and the windy road at the bottom of the hill is approaching rapidly. Politics is becoming more and more the act of looking at least slightly relaxed while silently praying that the accident will happen sometime after your term is up. <laughs> now, that's not completely fair. The fact that politicians are generally helpless in terms of public policy doesn't mean that to say that I think they're stupid. They do have a vague sense of what might be coming, and they're acting accordingly. To judge their efficiently, take a good look at the remaining public funds and the remaining public infrastructure and see who owns it in five years' time. Our leaders are reassuring us that this ship will sur certainly survive the coming storm. Oh yeah, no problem. But on closer inspection, they're either quietly pocketing the silverware or discreetly making their way to the lifeboats. Even politicians that are the exception, the ones that get it, that want to help, help get us out of this mess, are increasingly indistinguishable from ones that, jo that just pretend. We'll have to learn to navigate a world in which every imaginable aspect of being genuine or sincere has 10,000 spin doctors working on how to transplant that precise thing to the fake turds that run things. Now this all sounds really smug, like we, the hackers, the geeks, somehow have all the answers. We do not. But we do have some important parts. For one, we understand the extent to which complexity can be our enemy. We've all written stuff that got out of control. We've optimized our privatized world of today to get that last 2% of profitability. And we're already in a situation where everything we need comes just in time from China, assuming that we'll need exactly the same things overall as we needed a year ago. Everything is interconnected, and if one thing fails, the whole system goes down. Winter chaos that's been out recently, just another sign of slack that's in our current society. We also look in In that context, we can all see that our narrative is gaining importance. At the same time, Apple, Google, Facebook, and the more geographically challenged traditional governments will try to make all of humanity will try to make all of humanity enter their remaining secrets. They'll try to make attribution of every bit on the internet a part of the switch to IPv6 at the latest. They'll further lock us out of our own hardware and they'll eventually attempt to kill privacy and anonymity altogether. We still have to tell most people out there that privacy is not in fact brought about by some magic combination of the intentionally confusing privacy radio button page on Facebook. 
it does come from, among other things, code from some of us have written and code that some of us still need to write. We need many things by yesterday. And we need to properly security audit the tools we build, even if that means we can't put in new features just as quickly. Now we'll look at the future. Uh, the future is always hardest to predict. Um, I stand by our basic story of we lost the war. It's going to be a mess. I've just calmed down a lot when I decided for myself that this is not necessarily bad news, all of it. Let's face it, the current situation wasn't sustainable anyway. And people, both in rich and in poor countries, are not very happy now. Some may be rich, but we're not happy. Remember the massive loads of antidepressants we're taking to keep us going. The decline of the Roman Empire was probably a very interesting period to live in, and for most inhabitants, life just went on, with or without Rome. Okay, so the world is going to be a mess for a little bit. You may be asking yourself, what do I do with this knowledge? First of all, John Stewart had it nailed when he said recently at this, this event he organized, we live in difficult times, we do not live in end times. The future is not about finding solitude on a farm on a hill, guns, ammunition, but it is about having working trust relationships with the most varied group of people you can find. It's about imagining beyond today and picking up a wide range of skills if you can. It's positioning yourself such that you have flexibility. Even if everything stays, the same, there's not much in any of this. If, on the other hand, some of the structures around us indeed implode over the next decade or two, we as a community will become no less important. Again, the world is not going to end. I promise there will be no zombies and humanity will survive. A lot of structures will survive. It's just going to be quite messy for a little bit. Uh, lots of people will freak out. For us, we won't freak out so much because the news sites will just look more like Fafa's blog and TV news will be more like the Fnord Show. If the shit hits the fan, a lot of things are going to be decentralized, but still in a very networked world. Some of us will likely be reverse engineering and then re-engineering systems to get rid of some of the crazy complexity and dependencies. Improvising and doing more with less is something we are good at. Not, not to mention making things when we need them and repairing them instead of throwing them away. We come in peace. We're not called the Chaos Computer Club because we, fa we cause chaos. If anything, a lot of our collective work has actually prevented chaos by pointing out that maybe we should lay some decent virtual foundations before we build any more virtual skyscrapers. Val Holland explained the name to me many, many years ago. I don't even know exactly when. Uh, he's, he felt that there was universal validity in a set of then rather new theories explaining very complex systems and complex behavior from random events and a very few simple rules. And it helped him explain a lot of how the world worked and how one could navigate a future that looked like Shockwave Rider. We may not cause chaos, but we do understand some small part of how chaos works. And we have been able to help others deal with it better. As this world becomes more chaotic and ad hoc, we can help. Now this is the 27th Congress. I know 27 is not a nice round number where you have forced to look back like 23 or 42, but since, <laughs> but since I'm 42 years old this year, I get to take a little helicopter view. Um, I think we should all be proud of what's been created here. There's this video of the 24th Congress made by Kirin Schäuplein and others, and I can show that video to a wide variety of people. And they generally first say, wow. And then they go, when's the next one? And that sums up the importance of Dent. It has drawn countless people into community, many of whom didn't enter drivers. They weren't freebie kernels or Lisp programmers. But they are now as much a part of this community as anyone else. More than anything, this rather impressive gathering is what we use to show off how many sides there are to hacking. We may have been involved in some kind of hacking before we got here, but this Congress, more than any place else, is where it all comes together. This is where we decided that this is all so interesting and so important that we wanted to dedicate some part of our lives to it. 
Which brings me to how sad it makes me that we now need to click our tickets in the exact right few hours or otherwise they're gone. The people that set up the ticket system have done a great job making the best of a potentially very bad situation. But we... But sooner or later, we have to face the fact that this magnificent building is becoming too small, or rather that we are becoming too many. Either way, we've arrived at the point where we've begun to clog up one of the main pipes feeding us new people. In my view, Congress will eventually need to grow. Maybe next year, maybe the year after, but soon. Now this meets with very thoughtful opposition from people I respect and take very seriously. Slowly morphing this event into its next size up, say five or 6,000 people, is challenging, and if things go wrong, it could very well kill this event altogether. The negative example often used around me is DEF CON, an event I have not yet visited. But I've done some research. DEF CON 6, held 12 years ago in 1998, had about half as many attendees as are now in this building, and according to what I can find online, it already suffered from the same problems associated with DEF CON today, in full force. No real sense of community, way too much influence from the corporate and military universes, a sense of us versus them, misbehaving goons, one giant drunken, drunken frat party. I guess what I'm saying is that maybe there are some issues inherent to DEF CON that don't seem to bother this event to quite the same degree. But it's not just group culture that will be an issue. We've seemingly reached the limits of what a purely volunteer organization can do. Growing Congress is going to be challenging and dangerous. So I'm not saying we shouldn't be very careful. If we do decide to grow it, it'll take all the talent we have to keep the many aspects of this event that we all like and that we all need in one piece. At best, this event is going to be in mortal danger for a few years. But not growing has risks and dangers too. No matter how brilliantly we set up the distribution of tickets, when the hours to click a ticket become minutes, most of the potential new blood and many of us will be locked out. There are other solutions to the same problem, which I'm definitely not discounting. We could make more Congresses, either simultaneously or not. Uh, I just haven't missed a Congress since 1988, and I guess it, I would personally be quite sad if we couldn't all be together in one place, at least once a year. But whatever we decide, the next few years will test our ability to listen to each other, to come up with ideas and to work together to make them happen. Um, in closing off, anthropologist Margaret Mead once famously said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Now, that's all nice and well, but this gathering and this community, I think, have proven that there's still a sizable niche for really large groups of committed citizens. Uh, I wish you all an excellent Congress. Thanks for the talk, Rob. And everybody of us should think twice or three times about this, what he said right now. On the other hand, we are missing someone. So I'm trying to find him. You know, I'm a bald hacker, but I'm a bit, little bit tall. I'm not that funny on stage as he is. So you know why I'm talking about? Okay. And I'm wondering how could we find him? So I think the first is we dry out the people in the room. So all hackers on suits, stand up, come up here. Come on. Now you're afraid, yeah? Now you're dressed up and you're afraid? No way, huh?
thank you very much, all of you. So on the other hand, there are big many people up here. So the only thing I can think about is, everybody please stand up. Everybody. Everybody in the room, please stand up. And now, everybody sit down, except of Nick Farr. All you down there in the line. <laughs> Please stand up. Come on up here. Say no photos. <laughs> I, I, I'm actually having a hard time deciding who won this one. All of you guys, all of these, how many people are up here? 42. 42 or. <laughs> you guys win. Give yourselves a round of applause and give a round of applause for these guys. <laughs> And as you can see, I have a big gold chain. Actually, Sky T, is Sky T up here? No. Oh, Fobs, can you come over and explain? Get, get, tell, show them what this, show them what this chain is, real quickly. Well, it's not running because I wanted to get a wireless version, but we all know how the Congress network goes. Um, it's a megabit meter, um, <laughs> and at the bottom it says torrent because that's the nice part of megabits. Round of applause for Fobs and Sky T. Sky T, give, stand up. I, I never imagined that I would be one of the most underdressed people at a CCC event. <laughs> ever. Okay, so can I get off stage now? Is that okay? Thank you guys so much. See you. So thank you all, let's have a nice conference and we're setting up the next talk for you.